You're listening to the Rauha, Daily Guidance for Seekers with Sheikh Faraz Rabbani, who will be covering Imam Yusuf al-Nabahani's beautiful collection of 40 sets of 40 hadith of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, as well as Imam Zarnuji's guidance for seekers of knowledge regarding the ways of seeking knowledge. Ta'lim al-Mut'allim, Turuq al-Ta'lim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala Sayyidina wa Nabina Muhammad, wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa tabi'een, والتابعين لهم بإحسان وهدى إلى يوم الدين اللهم فقهنا في الدين وعلمنا التأويل وألهمنا رشدنا يا رب العالمين الحمد لله we're continuing to look at 40 hadiths on Iman and Islam and these hadiths highlight the tremendousness of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in gifting us with faith in our hearts and gifting us with the concern within to submit to him subhanahu wa ta'ala and we alhamdulillah reached hadith number 15 hadith number 15 of this collection by Sheikh Yusuf al-Nabahani rahimahullah ta'ala is related by Abu Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala anhu anna Abi Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala anhu anhu qal qala rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ayatul munafiqi thalaf the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said the signs of a hypocrite are three idha haddatha kathab wa idha wa'ada akhlaf wa idha tumina khan Rahu al-Bukhari wa Muslim. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, The signs of a hypocrite are three. If they speak, they lie. If they promise, they break their promise. And if they're trusted, they betray their trust. And this is related by Bukhari and Muslim. And there's a few things here. The signs of a hypocrite are three. Faith entails sincerity and being true. Because if we believe in Allah, it entails that we are sincere to Him. That we seek Him alone. Because Allah has created us. So we recognize that reality and he has commanded us. So we submit to that command. So faith entails sincerity in faith and in practice. Hypocrisy relates to faith, to iman, which is that one claims faith, but within One does not have faith, and that is the hypocrisy of faith. And there's the hypocrisy, so there's nifaqul iman, and there's nifaqul islam. Nifaqul islam is that one outwardly claims to submit, but one's conduct betrays the the trueness of one's submission. Um, So the signs of a hypocrite is three. Someone who claims that I'm a Muslim, but they don't act accordingly. So there's hypocrisy here in their conduct. If they speak, they lie. And the way it is stated in the Arabic, if you notice, إِذَا hadatha, when they speak, the consequence of the sentence is mentioned in the past tense, kathab. In the past, literally you'd say, if they speak, they have lied. And the reason it's put in the past tense, it's listahqiq, that it's it's a reality. That if they speak, it's inevitable or it's common that they will lie. Right? It is their habit that they lie. Means they don't care. 
they're not concerned. Likewise, if and is a hadatha if they if they speak to people, they invariably lie. Right? They're commonly lie, and lying is affirming something that one does not have good reason to believe is true. If they promise, if they make a commitment, I'll help, I'll do this, I'll do that, they break their promise. And that this is common. And this is, of course, making, th these are interrelated. Why? Because and this is why they say a nifaq, you know, hypocrisy, yuqabilu sidq. Right? Hypocrisy in action is the contrary of being true in conduct. So, being true in conduct, it's opposed by falsity. And the hypocrisy is being false. So, the, the opposite of being true as a believer will be manifest in one's speech by signs. That in general when one speaks, what is the opposite of being true? It's lying. Right? Because one is not committed to do the right thing, one's not committed to say the right thing. It's, that's what lying is. Lying goes against sidq, which is why the Prophet ﷺ told us that one of the qualities a believer could never have is lying. Right? Lying, cheating, deception, all of these go against the very sidq, the very being true, that the confirmation of truth, that is iman, goes against. Um, so it's a, lying is a very serious thing. Historians comment, many, many a great historian who, who was visiting Muslim lands commented that one of the things they noticed about the Muslims is that they don't lie. Right? There's a number of historians who went, entered India, for example, some of the Europeans when they uh, traveled through North Africa. They noticed this because it just goes against what Iman entails. إِذَا حَدَّثَ كَذَبْ Affirming something that one does not have reason to believe is true. Which of course entails, faith entails sound speech. Which is why so many spiritual paths begin their mujahada, their spiritual thriving, by trueness in speech, by not lying. And by leaving the other corollaries of lying in terms of sound speech. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, Ya yuhu ladheena amanu, or yuhu believe. Ittaqu Allah, be mindful of Allah, wa qulu qawlan sadeeda, and say words that are straight, right? that are purposeful, that are right. If you do so, yuslih lakum a'malakum, he will rectify for you your deeds, wa yaghfir lakum dhunubakum. And he will forgive for you your sins. And whoever obeys Allah and his messenger, فَقَدْ فَازَ فَوْزًا عَظِيمًا And whoever obeys Allah and his messenger has succeeded with a tremendous success. So this is, this is, lying goes fundamentally against being true. A broken promise is not in itself sinful, but if one regularly breaks one's promises, then the promise made when you did not have good reason to believe that you would fulfill it, it is essentially a lie. Right? If, if you think about what a promise is, if I say, I will help you do this. So you made a commitment. And you don't have good reason to believe that you could, then 
it is akin to a lie and it goes against being true. So to be someone who's true to their word, only make a commitment that you are sure that you are committed to fulfill and sure that you'll be able to fulfill. And if they're trusted, if they're trusted, they betray. And again, khana, khana yakhunu, it's in the past tense here. Khana yakhunu, khianatan. And betrayal is, betrayal of trusts is a grave matter. Right? And these two qualities that are corollaries of, of sin, the Prophet ﷺ said in another hadith that لا إيمان لمن لا أمانة له there is no faith in one who cannot be trusted ولا دين لمن لا عهد له and there is no religion in one who does not fulfill their commitments. نسأل الله العافية. This hadith is related by that narrations in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad and elsewhere. And one of the signs of the end of times, the Prophet ﷺ said, is irtifa'ul amana, is the lifting of trust. Is the, is the lifting of trust that no longer are people trustworthy and they do, and also they don't trust one another. Um, so it's a serious matter. And the Prophet, and in the narration, in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ added, وَإِنْ صَامَ وَصَلَّى وَزَعَمَ أَنَّهُ مُسْلِمٌ Even if they pray and fast and imagine that they are Muslim. And this term za'ama is imagining something to be one, one way, but when it is other. It is a false supposition. Because a, a Muslim is not simply someone who commits, who accepts to submit, but a, a true Muslim would be someone who accepts to submit and strives to submit. Okay. So this is, these are three areas that one should be very careful of, right? That we understand from it the opposite, that to be three signs of a person who is true is that they speak only truth. That they, they speak, they have spoken truth. If they promise, they fulfill their promises. And if they ever make any commitment that they're trusted in, they fulfill their trust. And these are qualities that one should strive to uphold oneself. And you know, these are the qualities of those whose company we try to keep, um, etc. Without judging them, but these, you know, we we act on the basis of judgment, and judgment is based on signs. The hadith number sixteen, عن أنس رضي الله تعالى عنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ثلاث من ثلاث من أصل الإيمان. So Anas said that the Messenger of Allah said three qualities are from the foundation of faith. Al Kafu Amman Kala La ilaha illallah La Nukafiruhu bi them Wala Nukrijuhu min al Islam bi Amal Sorry um, لا نكفره بذم ولا نخرجه من الإسلام بعمل ال... بعمل. Hmm. So the Prophet said three matters are from the foundation of faith: the refraining, you know, holding back from any who says لا إله إلا الله. Right? Holding back كف is holding back, meaning that one does not put them down, one does not attack them, right? We do not deem them a disbeliever by sin. 
بعمل and we do not take them out of Islam by any action الجهاد ماض مذبعثن الله تعالى إلى أن يقاتل آخر هذه الأمة الدجال لا يبطله جور جائر ولا عدل عادل right? And the Prophet ﷺ said Jihad remains from the time that Allah has sent me until the last of this ummah fights the false messiah the, 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 the Dajjal was one of the portents of the last times it is not negated by the oppression of an oppressor nor the justice of one who is just وَالْإِمَانُ بِالْأَقْدَارِ and faith in destiny so there's three things that are foundations of faith the first is to hold back from one who affirms la ilaha illallah we do not deem them disbelievers by sin nor do we deem them out of islam by some action that they did right? unless that action of course unless they do that which decisively takes one out of islam what decisively takes one out of islam Imam Al-Tahawi put it so beautifully, he said, لا يخرج المرأة عن الإسلام عن الإيمان إلا جحود ما أدخله فيه أو كما قال He said, nothing takes one out of Islam except to deny that which made them enter into it. Because if Iman is tasdeeq, if faith, if belief is to confirm as true, then what is kufr? Kufr is takdeeb. Kufr is denial. Right? Kufr is to deny. So if you do not deny that which makes someone a believer, which is to accept as true what the Messenger of Allah came with, then you're still a believer. You may be sinful, you may be seriously sinful, you may be an innovator, you may be misguided, but you're still a believer as long as you do not deny that which the Messenger of Allah came with of that which is necessarily known to be of the religion. That's the first principle, the first foundation, that we have tremendous, we recognize the inviolability of any who say la ilaha illallah. Second, jihad remains right, until the end of time. And jihad, which is the basis of jihad, is striving for truth. Right? Striving for truth. Right? And that jihad has multiple expressions. That jihad has multiple expressions. Sometimes it is, striving for truth, it is by calling to truth. Right? And da'wah, calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is a jihad. Right? By calling to Allah. Teaching the truth is jihad. Struggling against oneself is from jihad. Striving to spread the good is from jihad. Likewise, Striving against falsehood is also from jihad. Striving against oppression is also from jihad. And from jihad is fighting falsehood when fighting falsehood is called upon. And that jihad, um, an expression of it is the, the jihad of the battlefield right, with its conditions. Its conditions, one of one of which is one of the situations is when it's a matter of self-defense, or, or jihad in defense of those being wronged or attacked. Right? And that's one expression, and that's a primary, that's a, a fundamental situation where jihad is obviously permitted or obligatory when someone is being attacked. You don't just say, okay, kill me. Right? You have a right to defend your homeland. Likewise, if someone else is being wrongfully attacked, you have a right to defend them. But there is also the concept in Islam, like in other traditions, of just war. Right? Of just war. Right? With its principles. Right? With its principles. Right? But it is, it is not... A matter that one can just take on 
oneself, right? It has its its conditions. The jihad, being a public matter, is a matter that's up to either the the ruler or those in position to give the judgment that this is a situation where one must, where the community must fight. Right? Jihad is a matter that is affects the public interest. It's not a private decision. So it the basis is that it is the a Muslim ruler would make that decision, or you know, if they are not learned in with due consultation. And in the absence of a Muslim ruler, it's something that is a matter of a community, and then being a matter of of judgment, they must have engaged in sound consultation. So there's process and procedure in this matter. It is not that Farid decides he's upset, so he de declares jihad on his neighbors. Right? You, you can't do that. Why? Said because they don't let me play the duff. Right? Like that's it, it's not a matter of fickleness. And finally, well, imanu bil aqdar and belief in destiny. Right? That every uh, aqdar in destinies, that everything is by Allah's de decree and it is all destined by Allah. This hadith is related by Abu Dawood. And that's what we wanted to look at today of, of hadith. And they, they remind us, of course, of what qualities we should strive to uphold as believers. We're going to look also at Ta'lim al-Muta'allim by Imam al-Zarnuji. So, Imam Zarnuji is talking about um, the importance of having high resolve and urgency in seeking knowledge. And He emphasized in what we've been seeing the, the importance of appreciating the benefits of knowledge and that knowledge of religion is what is truly fruitful attainment in this life. Right? Because if you acquire it and you live it, this is what will eternally benefit. Particularly because most people are heedless of this, right? Nothing changes. All the prophets, right? Their people did not, re you know, people generally did not respond to truth. That's that's the human condition. Inna linsana lafi khusr. People did not respond to their prophets. Wa ma'an minhum illa qalil. Only few believed. Sometimes it was numerically exceedingly few but even if you look at it was what happened to the Prophet ﷺ, that his people pretty much all believed in the end that was the exception that was the exception right? generally yeah, people did not accept but even with believers you know, the forgetfulness of the human being خُلِقَ right? insanu. Da'ifa, humans have been created weak, inighafilan, um, heedless, etc. So if someone does have knowledge, right, one has the capacity to benefit a lot of people if one is, if one takes it seriously. And if one sees, if one recognizes the benefit it has for oneself, one would appreciate that in what it represents for oneself. And if one sees the, the capacity of benefiting others, one would appreciate that, which is why Imam Zarnuji says, وَكَفَى بِلَذَّةِ الْعِلْمِ وَالْفِقْهِ دَاعِيًا وَبَاعِثًا لِلْعَاقِلِ عَلَى تَحْصِيلِ الْعِلْمِ It is sufficient to, as a call for the intelligent person in attaining knowledge to taste, to have a taste of the taste of knowledge in fiqh. And the taste of knowledge here, we don't just mean 
the the amusement of knowledge the ladha the taste of something is experiencing its reality right is experiencing its reality right and what is the reality of of knowledge that knowledge is is light knowledge shows you the way it gives you clarity and confidence and certitude what is al fiqh fi al din so it's sufficient as a you know as a caller to the intelligent to acquire knowledge to experience the taste of knowledge that if you acquired a little knowledge now you know how to act so if you acquired more you would know more how to turn to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala understanding of the religion that now you know how to make sincere intentions you know how to dis- distinguish between benefit and harm and that you know, that experience should as the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said to the companion idha arafta falzam if you know then stick with it right and that 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 experience that joy arising out of gratitude right this is not just the mere worldly satisfaction right so this is something that you should see what does knowledge represent in in your life or what could it represent in your life the potential it has and for those of religious concern the people we look up to right what made them what gave them the capacity to be transformed human beings it is a fact that they were blessed to attain knowledge that they acted upon and were transformed by what gave them the capacity to be able to benefit others it is th- their knowledge and understanding that they acquired through striving and then that they were transformed by through striving so that should be sufficient motive for the intelligent person he says waqad yatawalladu al-kasal min kathrat al-balghami wal rutubat right that laziness can can also arise from having excessive phlegm and humidity and this has to do with the um, idea of how we understand the human temperaments um, and which we won't get into it says wa tariqu taqlilihi taqlilu ta'am the way of diminishing that diminishing laziness arising from an unhealthy state is reducing one's eating and reducing one's eating meaning bringing one's eating closer to the sunnah bringing one's eating closer to the sunnah the sunnah is that arguably the greatest summary of you know of healthy living is the words of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam ma mala ma mala ibn adam wi'an sharran min batn The, the the child of adam fills no container more detrimental than a stomach bi hasab imri'in luqaymat yuqimna biha sulba it is sufficient for a person to have a few small morsels by which they keep their back straight right meaning that gives them the strength to direct themselves to fulfilling their obligations and responsibilities to pursue benefit to keep from harm فَإِنْ كَانَ لَا مَحَالَ And if one must, then فَثُلُثٌ لِطَعَامِهِ وَثُلُثٌ لِشَرَابِهِ وَثُلُثٌ لِنَفَسِهِ And if one must, then one has one-third of for one's food, one-third for one's drink, and one-third to be able to breathe. And a third of one's fill is to eat about half what one would normally incline to eat. And that's the taqlil, is to bring it Now most people go way above that. Right? And that's part of the human instinct for survival. Um and part of the Allah has placed these desires within us as part of the the test in this life. So it is to bring that 
to realign that with the Sunnah. وقيل اتفق السبعون نبيا عليهم الصلاة والسلام على أن على أن أكثر النسيان من كثرة البلغم وكثرة البلغم من كثرة شرب الماء وكثرة شرب الماء من كثرة الأكل. So he said it is it is said that seventy prophets all agreed, meaning in their teachings, that excessive forgetfulness is from excessive phlegm, and excessive phlegm is from excessive drink, and excessive drinking of water is from excessive eating. Right? It is said. Right? The point being that you know, if you eat excessively, one just the act of eating excessively, people are always busied by by these concerns what will we eat what will we go let's go here let's do this. rather than prioritizing what is important um, so one in terms of just how much at attention and focus goes to the merely mundane aspect of eating and secondly excessive eating results in laziness results in ill health um, etc which all affect one's the, the health of one's mind he says well khubzul yabis yaqta'ul balgham says and dry bread cuts phlegm right and part of that of course khubzul yabis dry bread meaning and there's also a practical element to this there's a reality of baraka of blessedness that it is clear in prophetic teachings that one does not waste food. Right? And people have bad habits. You, know, you, get, you get a loaf of bread, and when it gets towards the end, you buy f fresh bread, but th those last couple of slices, they're s slightly stale. If they're at the back of the fridge, they may be slightly, there's that slightly soggy, but not yet moldy kind of state. Um, all those kinds of things. Who wants to eat that? Who wants to eat the ends of the bread, etc.? But practically, we know that the f finishing food right, is blessed. That's a separate aspect to it. Right? Um, likewise, وَكَذَلِكَ أَكْلُ الزَّبِيبِ عَلَى الرِّيقِ Likewise, eating raisins, and, you know, um, you know, directly, uh, meaning without eating it with other things. وَلَا يُكْثِرْ مِنْهُ حَتَّى لَا يَحْتَاجَ إِلَى شُرْبِ الْمَاءِ فَيَزِيدُ الْبَلْغَمِ But one does not eat them excessively, so that one does not have to drink water, um, too much water, so that one increases in one's uh, phlegm. Um, excessive drinking of water... Um, the, generally, we see the sunnah of drinking water is to drink in sips rather than gulps. So I, I asked more than I asked several um, hakims, traditional practitioners of medicine. Then you know, there's this big fad of everyone walking around with big jugs, like you know, big, these big bottles of water that you have to drink two and a half water, liters of water a day or whatever. I mean, there's little scientific basis for that. But the reason I asked is because we know that the sunnah is to drink in sips and gulps. Now, if you're going to, if you're going to sip water, it's pretty hard to drink two and a half liters of water a day. Okay. But rather, so what Hakim Archuleta, may Allah preserve him, said that, no, ra rather, you, you drink water when you're thirsty. And you make sure you drink, you know, you drink in the morning and you drink in the, you know, in the evening so that, you, you, you do drink and and the other guide, guidance on drinking, but excessive drinking of water, it's, it's foolish. Just go straight through the system. Um, and also there's other detriments to excessive drinking of water. Just drinking water all the time, and you're going to, to the washroom all the time. Right? And, that's, and that's not where we want to live. Um, وَالسِّوَاكُ يُقَلُّ الْبَلْغَمْ وَيَزِيدُ فِي الْحِفْظِ وَالْفَصَاحَةِ فَإِنَّهُ سُنَّةٌ سَنِيَةٌ He said, and the siwak, and the tooth stick, um, reduces phlegm, and, and sharpens memory and eloquence. And it is a radiant sunnah. 
ويزيد في الثواب الصلاة وقراءة القرآن and it increases in the reward of prayer and the reward of recitation of the Quran. Right? And the siwak, the, the, you know, it, once you just make it a practice to, ke- to keep a tooth stick with one. Because while the sunnah is fulfilled by brushing one's teeth, but you, you can't carry toothbrush and toothpaste with you everywhere. And brushing one's teeth, keeping one's teeth clean, um, keeping one's be- breath fresh has a social benefit because we interact with human beings, but also it has a spiritual benefit that this is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Brushing one's teeth cleans uh, the siwak, uh, brushing one's teeth uh, cleans one's mouth and pleases one's Lord. The social aspect to it, the practical aspect, and there's a spiritual aspect to it. And it sharpens memory. Wallahu alam. This is based on tajruba um, and eloquence. Right? Um, and many of these things sometimes are strange. Right? Strange in the sense that sometimes. You know, people have experienced these things by tajruba. You don't have to believe it, but you'll find that if you actually do it, you'll find that it, it's true. So be careful how much you don't believe the scholars. It's like someone said they, they never b- believed this thing about eating, I forget, he'll mention, I think, 21 raisins or something, or 23 raisins. And he did it, and he found his mem- memory was significantly better when he's trying to memorize the Quran. Right? And Allah has. These khawas, these, he has placed these gifts of facilitation in many different matters. And brushing one's teeth increases in the reward of prayer. Right? So one should not leave brushing one's teeth before, you know, in one's wudu, because it's a sunnah in wudu. In the Hanafi school, it said emphasize sunnah in wudu. But before prayer, we know there's, it's recommended before prayer. To brush one's teeth. You don't have to do it at the moment before you pray. The fuqahat differ, but in the time before the prayer, one brushes one's teeth discreetly. You don't have to advertise to everyone you're doing it. And inc- likewise increases the reward of recitation of the Quran. Before you sit down to recite the Quran, you quickly brush your, te- brush your teeth before you meet people in the other places. Um, And then he also says, um, Likewise, vomit reduces phlegm and uh, um, the, the wetness with, uh, within. But th- it's not a religious act. He, that's a sort of an aside. That also does it, but he's not saying go and vomit if you, if you overeat or anything like that. It should be taqlil. The, the, the way to reduce eating طريق التقليل الأكل التأمل في منافع قلة الأكل The way to reduce eating, meaning excessive eating, is to reflect on the benefits of reducing eating. وهي الصحة والعفة والإثار And it goes back to three things. It is health. It preserves your own health. Right? They say... It is sufficient ignorance for a person to be pleased by what harms them. And that is ignorance itself. وَالْعِفَّةِ And dignified restraint. Right? And that part of it is by upholding the sunnahs of eating, and they say particularly when very hungry. So when you want to disappear in the burger, that's when you... Take greatest care to eat slowly, chew completely, reduce morsel size, don't lift, don't reach for the food until you've swallowed what you've already taken, all these many sunnas. So the, the three fundamental benefits of reducing excessive eating is your own health, dignified restraint, ifa, which is a fundamental quality that a believer should have. The Prophet used to make a lot of dua for ifa. He taught us. Uh, or afaf, 
wal ithar and prefer and preference preferring others to oneself and preferring others to oneself part of it is that the prophet said the food for one is enough for two and the food for two is enough for four um, and then we'll close with these lines he says وَقَدْ قِيلَ فَعَارٌ ثُمَّ عَارٌ ثُمَّ عَارٌ شَقَاءُ الْمَرْئِ مِنْ أَجْلِ الطَّعَامِ He said, what blame, then what blame, then one, what blame. Aar is something blameworthy. Okay. For, a, a, for a person to be destroyed because of food. It's so foolish, because food is meant to be the means of your world, for, of your preservation. You don't eat, you'll die. But, but you die because you eat. That's madness. And then he says, وَعَنِ النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَمْ أَنَّهُ قَالْ ثَلَاثَةُ نَفَرٍ بَغَضَهُمُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى مِنْ غَيْرِ جُرْمِ So there's three qualities of people, said the Prophet, three types of people that Allah, يُبْغِضُهُمُ الله, that Allah hates, it, despite them not committing a crime, a jurm is like a crime. Al akulu wal bakhilu wal mutakabbir. A crime meaning like, because normally someone's hated not by just committing a sin, but by being a criminal. Right? One is the excessive eater. The second is the stingy person. It's not a big crime. You don't actually do it. You're just stingy. You're not spending. You won't. You would think it's a big deal. And part of it is because someone who eats a lot, no, who thinks that when they're eating a lot, they say, oh, just a little more biryani, a little more mensaf, a little more this, a little more that. That becomes a habit and you're harming yourself. It is a khiyana. It is not fulfilling the trust that is your body or the potential that is your life. Al-Bakhil, the stingy person. All you did was not give. So it's not considered bad, but it is actually of great detriment. Wal mutakabbir and the arrogant person. A lot of people don't recognize the harm in it. Wa ta'amul fi madari kathrat al akl wa hi al amradu wa kalala al tabr. And said, and from reflection, in the harms of excessive eating, includes. All the sicknesses caused by it. Right? And having a weak temperament. Right? Because if you don't eat properly, you won't have a balance of temperament. And it is said that a big stomach, an increasing stomach, does away with a sharp mind. A bloated stomach leads to a blunted mind. Right? It is said. Right? Imam al-Shafi, and this is not of course an absolute. Imam al-Shafi said, ma, ma aflaha saminun qat. No fat man ever succeeded, illa an yakuna Muhammad ibn al-Hasan. Unless it, it, it were someone like Muhammad ibn al-Hasan. Because Muhammad al-Hasan was rather large, but he was remarkably remarkable. Um, and he expands on this significantly. Why? Partially also because the nature of study is that it is a passive occupation. Okay? And you see a lot of ulama, they're large in size, not because they're, they overeat, but just because it's a passive profession. And the same thing applies actually to a lot of people who now a lot of people do sit, sit down, work. Right? And they may not actually be eating. They may not be big eaters, but just they're very passive. I met a, a, I, I had befriended a Bedouin, a righteous Bedouin man in Jordan. They said, I, I ate exactly like my father used to eat, but he lived to be 90 or 80. Well, past 80. Um, and I, I don't know if I'll get to 50. Because <laughs> he was having serious health issues. Right? 
in his late 40s. Why? Because they used to, like his father, he said that his father used to walk 15, 20 kilometers a day because they herd sheep. They're Bedouin. So I sit in my office. He had a construction company and so on. So if, if, if I ate like he ate, that, and he used to, I'm dying. Right? So one has to be aware of taking care of one's health in general but if he wants to study then one has to maximize one's health so that one can live long have the well-being to be able to focus have the well-being to be able to exert oneself in the, the way that seeking knowledge requires exerting oneself um, and then he mentions n next lesson we'll look at some of the things that are related from some of the um, scholars to be of, of benefit. So this is, you know, taking care of one's health is an important duty for a believer in general and for a seeker of knowledge or someone calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in particular. Um, and it begins by reducing what one eats and eating in accordance with the sunnah. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina wa nabina Muhammad. Thank you for listening to the Rauha, daily guidance for seekers with Sheikh Faroz Rabbani. Help Seekers Hub give light to millions around the world by supporting us through monthly donations by going to seekershub.org slash donate. Your donations are tax deductible in the U.S. and Canada.